I would like to start looking into the past. 30 years ago, we first described arrhythmogenic right ventricular myopathy as a cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes. This was my thesis of specialization in cardiology. I specialized in 1986, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1988. And you can see here that this condition was found in 20% of our sudden cardiac death victims in the setting of uh, a prospective clinical pathologic study in the Veneto region uh, of Italy. This was an absolutely novel findings because uh, this condition was previously unrecognized. And so was a replacement of the right ventricle by fibro fatty tissue. Usually the uh, culprit ventricle was the left ventricle as a cause of sudden cardiac death. This was absolutely a novelty. Consider that the editors asked us all the specimens, histologic specimens, or all cases, because they didn't trust us about this condition. So we sent to the New England Journal of Medicine all the, the rec records, records of all cases. So uh, it was interesting because in, 19, eight, uh, in 1992, I was at St. George's Hospital to spend, I spent one year in my fellowship with Professor McKenna, and at that time, uh, I knew uh, uh, Professor Michael Davis. And one morning, I remember, he asked me, uh, come with me. And uh, we, we went to the, to the, to the lab, the, the, the pathologic lab, and uh, he showed uh, several hearts coming from sudden cardiac death in uh, young people, individuals, that were sent by local pathologists in the UK. And he said, look, this is a RVC. This was considered a normal heart. So I remember I have this, uh, this uh, uh, so, 30 years later, arrhythmogenic ventricular myopathy has been definitely recognized as uh, an inherited condition, genetic condition, characterized by fibro fatty replacement, predominantly by fibro fatty replacement of the right ventricular uh, myocardium. That, so, in other words, the concept of cardiomyopathy completely replaced the concept of uh, arrhythmogenic ventricular dysplasia that was originally, originally proposed as a cause of, uh, of, uh, of the disease. Uh, in other words, it's not a, a development disease, but it's an acquired disease uh, due to genetic, a genetic defect. So, at the present time, there is an increasing use of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy designation instead of arrhythmogenic right ventricular designation. Because this designation of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is more comprehensive, comprehensive and better describes the concept of a large variety of phenotypes of the disease that not include only the, right ventricular, the original right ventricular one, but also uh, left ventricular phenotype uh, that uh, can be biventricular or left predominant uh, uh, disease. So at the present time, we use the terms of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy to define a genetically determined heart muscle disease, in other words, a cardiomyopathy that is characterized by pathologically by fibro fatty replacement of both the right and left ventricle. You can see here that the left ventricle involvement is very similar, as showed Mary previously, very similar to the uh, right involvement that is characterized by fibro fatty, by fibro fatty replacement coming from the epicardial, the of the, of the, of the wall, and progressing to the subendocardium. And the clinically, this condition is characterized, mostly characterized by ventricular tachycardia and the rhythmic sudden death that are the result of the fibro fatty scar of the myocardium. So in 1994, uh, were proposed the original International Task Force criteria for diagnosis of the disease. According to this uh, 1994 criteria, the diagnosis was achieved using a polyparametric, multiparametric approach uh, based on a series of criteria coming from different uh, groups of uh, clinical features, including family history, uh, ECG depolarization, repolarization of lomitis, arrhythmias, global and regional dysfunction, and structural alteration of the ventricle, or the right ventricle, and uh, uh, fibro fatty replacement of the myocardium on endomyocardial biopsy uh, as a uh, criterion for tissue characterization of wall. So the diagnosis was reached when two major criteria, one major and two minor or four minor criteria 
were fulfilled according to this criteria. So you can see here some uh, uh, features, diagnostic features, but clinical manifestation of the disease that uh, encompass uh, Representation of abnormalities, stimulus inversion of hypercordial leads, arrhythmias with the left bundle branch block morphology indicating the origin from the, uh, the right ventricle, depolarization abnormalities, mostly epsilon waves in hypercordial leads, morphofunctional uh, uh, right ventricular abnormalities, and fibro fatty myocardial replacement uh, seen at in vivo at endomyocardial biopsy uh, evaluation. So in 2010, this diagnostic criteria were revised. This was the result of a consensus conference held, we held in, uh, in uh, Denver in the United States, and uh, you can see here that uh, uh, these criteria were modified, the criteria were modified with the aim to provide quantitative criteria for right ventricular dilatation dysfunction by different imaging techniques and histopathologic changes at the endomarcarial biopsy to enhance the diagnostic specificity of morphofunctional right ventricular abnormalities, to differentiate the diagnostic specificity of right ventricular arrhythmias according to the morphology site of origin, to recognize the specificity of right precordial T waves inversion and QRS prolongation, and most importantly, to add molecular genetic criteria for increasing diagnostic sensitivity for ARVC. In other words, these criteria were reviewed and re de uh, uh, designed to uh, diagnose the original right ventricular phenotype. So at that time, molecular genetics uh, uh, demonstrated that the disease is a desmosomal disease characterized by genetic defects of the gene encoding from proteins that, are, that constitute the desmosome that uh, account for mechanical attachment of myocytes, and according to the mechanical theory, the uh, uh, genetically defective de desmosomes predispose to uh, myocyte detachment, uh, myocardial, uh, myocyte degeneration, necrosis, and uh, that with the fibrofatty myocardial uh, replacement. So at that time was introduced this molecular screening in the clinical setting for preclinical genetic diagnosis of the disease. So the use of this criteria for 10 years showed that these 2010 criteria have several limitations. So this forthcoming international expert document will, ad will address these limitations. The document is evaluation of the current diagnostic criteria and uh, differential diagnosis will be published in a few days. I reviewed the, the, the proofs uh, yesterday. So, the may, which are the, may, the limitations of this 2010 diagnostic criteria? So, the most important is that the genetic test is an integral part of the diagnostic uh, scoring system. According to the 2010 diagnostic criteria, the identification of a pathogenetic mutation is considered a major criterion for the disease. So there are no other uh, uh, heart muscle disorder uh, in, in cardiology that uh, recognize I mean, genetic findings as a major criteria for diagnosis. So in other words, if genetic molecular findings take part in the, in the, in the I mean, diagnostic scoring system for, for uh, the diagnosis of the disease, there is a, the risk to misdiagnose the disease. This is due to the limitation of our understanding in the background, genetic background of the disease, but most importantly, the high background genetic noise for the RBC. In other words, there are a lot of uh, uh, variants of uncertain significance that are difficult to interpret. So this misinterpretation of non-pathogenetic DNA variants as a pathogenetic mutation leads to misdiagnosis, an increasing misdiagnosis uh, of the disease in problems not fulfilling the criteria for a phenotypic diagnosis. This is a problem. So in other words, the diagnosis is based, mostly based on, clean, on genetics. So the future uh, diagnostic criteria uh, should consider diagnosis, diagnosis in problem will be based just on phenotypic features of the disease. Genotyping is important, very important, for assessment of the genetic etiology of the disease for preclinical diagnosis in relatives, 
cascade family screening, and prognosis. But the disease is based on phenotypic uh, manifestation. And we deal with uh, a cardiomyopathy, which is a structural hallmark, but this is not uh, with an uh, ion channel disorder. So it's not acceptable that ARVC, longer acceptable, that ARVC diagnosis is fulfilled in the absence of structural functional ventricular abnormalities in a proband. In other words, with the new criteria, we require that at least a minor structural functional criterion for the disease is fulfilled for uh, diagnosis. The 2010 diagnostic criteria were very specific for the diagnosis of the disease because, as previously mentioned, they <coughs> consider that the diagnosis, a major or minor criterion for diagnosis, is due to the result of combination of dilatation slash, slash dysfunction plus, very importantly, wall motion abnormalities. That means right ventricular akinesia, dyskinesia, or aneurysm, not hypokinesia. So why is this important, the, these wall motion abnormalities? Because if you consider just right ventricular dilatation, as previously mentioned, stressed, this uh, right ventricular dilatation, the echocardiography, is not specific. Can be shared by other conditions, such as, for example, athletes' heart in athletes, in endurance athletes. What is that is specific is that uh, in the right ventricular flow tract of these individuals, there is an aneurysm in the right ventricular flow tract. And uh, this, uh, uh, at the basis of this aneurysm, there is labial adrenal enhancement. This is very important. It's very important the combination of the wall motion abnormalities and the underlying labial adrenal enhancement that means fiber of fatty myocardial replacement in this disease. So this is the highly, high, high specific, uh, uh, I mean, combination for diagnosis. And unfortunately, in the 2010 diagnostic criteria, labial adrenal enhancement findings were not included in the diagnostic criteria. So this was the third major limitation. Tissue calibration images findings by CMRR were excluded from diagnosis in the previous uh, diagnostic criteria. And this is very important because wall motion abnormalities, akinesia, dyskinesia, aneurysm, reflect the underlying fibrofatty myocardial replacement that is the hallmark of the disease. So the more specific, uh, I mean, clinical, I mean, uh, uh, structural uh, abnormalities that uh, suggest, uh, that lead to the diagnosis of the disease. And at that time, the tissue characterization was left just to endomyocardial biopsy because at that time we were uh, not so, uh, I mean, <clears throat> we, we didn't trust so much the lateral enhancement interpretation. But now, with the progresses in the, in the interpretation of the lateral enhancement uh, images findings, uh, tissue gradation for fibrofatty myocardial replacement must be routinely provi provided by uh, carrier magnetic resonance and indicating no probands and family members because in the only way to characterize the phenotype of the disease because allow to identify late gradient enhancement not only in the right ventricle but also in the left ventricle that uh, as we will see uh, uh, cannot, can be missed by echocardiography. So the fourth point is that uh, the 2010 diagnostic criteria lack of specif specific diagnostic criteria for left dominant disease variants. So because uh, autopsy investigation, genotype and phenotype evaluation study, but most importantly, the increasing use of contrast enhanced cardiomagnetic resonance led to the concept that uh, the original right ventricular phenotype that is characterized by isolated or associated with the minor left ventricular moment is uh, the, is associated. I mean, th there are other important, uh, I mean, uh, phenotype, uh, phenot phenotypic variants that instead are characterized by biventricular phenotypic involvement, uh, uh, left ventricular involvement, and the right ventricular involvement, and the left dominant phenotype that is characterized by early and prominent left ventricular manifestation. There is a fourth phenotype. This is a study, a long term outcome study on individuals carrying desmosomal gene mutations. We excluded those with ventricular tachycardia or cardiac arrest. And we followed these individuals for a long time. The mean follow-up was 8.5 years. So 
you can see uh, that the rate of, uh, of complication, major rhythmic complication, was 0.9% uh, uh, per year. So most importantly, we observe that major complication occurred only in those individuals with a definite diagnosis of the disease, so with a well-expressed phenotype of the disease, and particularly in those with risk factors, that means syncope, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, ventricular, uh, systolic ventricular dysfunction, in all but one. This was a 15-year-old male victim of sudden cardiac death that two months previously underwent screening in the setting of a family evaluation because this family was uh, uh, a carrier of desmoplaque in the gene uh, mutation. So this, this 15 year old uh, male died suddenly despite, the electrocard the, despite an electrocardiogram and an echocardiogram normal. So the, the first reaction was he died in the absence of structural abnormalities, was a primary electrical heart disease due to, I mean, uh, uh, desmoplakin uh, uh, mutation that in, its, in itself can account uh, for, for uh, electrical instability, but the autopsy showed the reason. So this individual showed a segmental scar that was confined in the uh, subepicardial layer of the left ventricular wall. And this scar usually is under the power resolution power, the resolution, resolution power of the echocardiography. And uh, so it was missed by the routine uh, screening. So instead, the scar could be evidenced, clearly evidenced by cardiac MRI with the late gadolinium enhancement in another family member of the same family with the, uh, that was uh, in a symptomatic 23-year-old family with a desmosomal, with the desmoplakin gene mutation. You can see here exactly the same scar in the subepicardial uh, layer. So this is the, 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 the fourth phenotype. It's an isolated left ventricular scar that can be an equivalent, a phenotypic equivalent of the, of the disease. So this scar is an increasing cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes in our experience. And you can see some example of this scar uh, as evidenced by cardiac MRI. And most importantly, this scar is missed by echocardiography because it's segmental, involves just the outer layer of the left ventricular wall and spares the subendocardial muscle that mostly contributes to contractility. So the echocardiography usually is not seen uh, and usually also is uh, electrocardiographically silent. Only 20% of affecting the general show t waves inversion lateral leads or, or, or small uh, QS amplitudes in limb leads. So this was a the cause of sudden cardiac death in an hour soccer player. Uh, you remember, Sanjay, we were, we were in Spain when we received the notice that uh, there was a sudden cardiac death in this uh, Italian soccer player. And uh, at that time, of course, there were, there, we, we didn't know he died from myocardial infarction or cardiomyopathy. So this was the ECG at the time of pre-participation screening. It was normal except for a trend towards small voltages in uh, limb leads. Of course, it's uh, a post uh, evaluation. And uh, look at the autopsy. This is very important. Look at the autopsy. He didn't perform cardiac MRI because it was considered normal pre-participation screening. But the autopsy showed the typical isolated left ventricular scar in the left ventricular myocardial, subepicardial, but most importantly, there was histolo histopathologic evidence of fiber fatty replacement of the right ventricle too, of the right ventricle. It was not a large scar, microscopical evidence, but there was evidence. So, we are moving from the concept of a triangle of dysplasia affecting the inflow, the apex, and outflow tract of the right ventricle to the concept of quadrangle of dysplasia, of cardiomyopathy, that also involves an <coughs> the inferolateral region of the left ventricle in terms of <coughs> subepicardial scar. What about the electrocardiographic abnormalities. <clears throat> so the 2010 original diagnostic criteria uh, consider just ECG abnormalities for right ventricular involvement, for the original right ventricular phenotype, in terms of T-waves inversion, right precordial leads, terminal activation, delay in the QRS 
explored by D1 to V3, epsilon waves, <coughs> and so on, and arrhythmias with the left mandel branch block morphology suggesting the origin from the right ventricle. And arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, were subsequently divided in uh, left, uh, left bundle branch block and inferior axis that was less specific because uh, most of these conditions are idiopathic uh, right ventricular flotal tachycardia, and arrhythmias with left bundle branch block and superior axis that is more specific because, of course, there is no overlap with idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias. So which are the new electrocardiographic criteria we will introduce in the new criteria for diagnosis? First of all, of course, to evaluate uh, left ventricular involvement. First of all, the low QS voltages, QS voltage in limb leads. In this study, uh, we, recent, we published recently, the presence of low QS voltage, that means less than 0 0.5 millivolt, 0 0.5 millivolt, is extremely specific, highly specific for left ventricular involvement. 100% of individuals with arrhythmogenic left ventricular myopathy actually had uh, uh, a left ventricular scar when the ECG showed the low voltages criteria. So of course, t worse inversion lateral leads may be, of course, an electrographic uh, predictor of uh, left ventricular scar, as are t worse inversion in inferior uh, leads, and ventricular arrhythmias and ventricular tachycardia with the right bundle branch morphology that denotes the origin from the left ventricle. So the identification of this new left ventricular phenotype, biventricular left dominant, raised the problem of differential diagnosis of left dominant of or isolated left ventricular arrhythmogenic and left ventricular caromyopathy from dilated caromyopathy. So electrocardiographic criteria, clinical criteria, and imaging findings can help us for this differential diagnosis. Look at these two cases, both undergoing heart transplantation. This is a case of dilated cardiomyopathy. The ECG shows left mandel branch block, complete left mandel branch block morphology. Look at the cardiac magnetic resonance. Show segmental, patchy, uh, late Galdini enhancement in the septum, and the histologic evaluation shows interstitial fibrosis with preserved myocytes. Look instead, this case with a case of isolated left ventricular, arrhythmogenic left ventricular myopathy. The ECG shows very low voltages in uh, limb leads, a almost circumferential late Godolini enhancement in the superpicardial layer of the left ventricle, and look at the histologic. There is a replacement type fibrosis in the, corresponding to the, to the late Godolini enhancement and uh, uh, myocyte death with the fibrofatty replacement. So the cardiac MRI can help us in distinguishing between uh, these two conditions. Those individuals with an overlapping phenotype can be uh, differentiated on the basis of the regional involvement by the late Galdini enhancement that in ARVC is mostly confined to the inferobasal left ventricular wall. Instead, in the, the late caromyopathy is mostly confined in the septum. And uh, in, the transmural, uh, uh, in the transmural involvement uh, that is mostly subepicardial in ARVC, while it is uh, mid-mural, mid-myocardial in the uh, uh, caromyopathy. Also, the amount of late Galdini enhancement, that is, the amount of left ventricular fibrosis can distinguish. You can see in, in our experience, in dilated cardiomyopathy, the amount of left ventricular fibrosis is significantly lower compared with arrhythmogenic left ventricular cardiomyopathy. More than 20% of fibrotic replacement of the uh, ventricular, left ventricular mass is extremely specific for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And but most importantly is the relation between ejection fraction, systolic function, and the amount of left ventricular fibrosis. This is a case of dilated cardiomyopathy. There is a severely dilated left ventricle with important, significant 
left ventricular systolic dysfunction. This is a dilated cardiomyopathy. Look at the late Gaudinian enhancement images. There is a patchy fibrosis in the mid myocardium. So in other words, this is, there is a disproportion between the dilatation dysfunction of the left ventricle and the fibrosis. Because in dilated cardiomyopathy, the premium movens is the contractile dysfunction, dysfunction of the myocyte. And then from the, uh, fr uh, the, the, the Frank uh, Starling low, the ventricle dilated, uh, dilates and so on. So look instead at the case of arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy. Here, you can see here, there is hypokinetic non-dilated left ventricle. Hypokinetic non-dilated left ventricle. And if you check the post late regarding enhancement images, you can see that this is a, a large amount of ventricular fibrosis. In other words, here, ventricular fibrosis is the cause, not the epiphenomenon of left ventricular dysfunction. Now, usually it doesn't induce a significant left ventricular dysfunction because it's confined to the subepicardial layers. So look, if you compare the left ventricular ejection fraction if you relate left ventricular ejection fraction, left ventricular labial ring enhancement in arrhythmogenic right ventricular myopathy, you can see that there is a perfect correlation. While if you perform this correlation in dilated cardiomyopathy, there is not. Because fibrosis is not the cause, but it's the consequence of left ventricular dysfunction. So this is important because according to, the, to this uh, idea, this concept that uh, hypokinetic non-dilated left ventricle is a sort of uh, less expressive dilated cardiomyopathy. It's not true. It's another disease. This is uh, arrhythmogenic left ventricular cardiomyopathy. So, a few more slides, a few minutes to conclude this concept is very important. So, in this paper, we address the concept of arrhythmogenic aromyopathy. And uh, we, so this is the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy phenotype, as we said. It's characterized by mild ventricular dilatation dysfunction with prominent, prominent myocardial fibrosis, labial enhancement, and propensity to malignant ventricular arrhythmias. This phenotype is not exclusive of uh, desmosome arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy. But, by analogy with the, the classification of dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we can, we can consider also for this condition, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, a more comprehensive etiologic classification of the disease. So you can see here that 50% of the disease is induced by, uh, uh, is desmosomal, is due to genetic defects of the gene encoding for desmosomal proteins. But there is a 20-30% of non-desmosomal forms that can due to non-desmosomal gene mutation, can be occurring in the setting of neuromuscular conditions, can occur as a consequence of the inflammatory cardiomyopathy such as myocarditis, chronic myocarditis, or sarcoidosis, can be the result of a cardiomyopathy, the so-called arrhythmogenic dilated cardiomyopathy, may be congenital, may be infective. So these are examples of a lamina AC cardiomyopathy, look at the same fibrosis amount of, large amount of fibrosis, of filament C-related cardiomyopathy, two father and son died suddenly with the same circumferential uh, fibrosis. Look at phospholamban cardiomyopathy with the same phenotypic uh, features of the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Look at this uh, Becker disease, uh, uh, postmyocarditis scar, and uh, arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy, desmosomal pla plaque related cardiomyopathy. You can see here, the same aspect of the fiber fatty replacement in the left ventricular wall. And finally, carrier sarcoidosis that can reproduce the phenotype of the disease. So in, which are the clinical implications of this more comprehensive uh, etiologic classification? That this classification include condition, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, that are associated with a distinctly higher risk of sudden cardiac death. The pathogenesis of life threatening ventricular arrhythmias extends beyond the severity of systolic ventricular dysfunction, being strongly related to the large amount of myocardial fibrosis, which is the independent uh, arrhythmogenic risk factor. As a corollary, ICD therapy for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death is indicated early in the disease course, regardless of the etiology. 
where ventricular systolic function is still relatively well preserved. This is my last slide. So experience with the 2010 international transport criteria reveals significant limitation that need to be overcome by future revision proxy next of the diagnostic approach. 2020 upgrading of the international test for criteria should take into account the following points, issues. Limitation of the current understanding of the genetic background of the disease that translates into the risk of misdiagnosis if molecular genetics test is an integral part of the diagnostic scoring system. Advances of technology and improvement of interpretation of tissue characterization images by cardiac MRI which has become the leading imaging test for assessment of the disease phenotype and the broader spectrum of the LVC phenotype, which includes left dominant disease variants requiring specific diagnostic uh, uh, criteria. Thank you for your attention.